Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Scott Page, and I'm a faculty member at U of M Ross and an LSNA in the Department of Complex Systems, Political Science, and Economics. I'd like to welcome University Provost Susan Collins and President Mark Schissel to what I hope is going to be the first in a series of open and frank conversations with the university community about our current situation. We're at a moment here, right? The university and our society at large find themselves confronting a complex set of challenges in the midst of a global pandemic. We've all witnessed the shooting and murder of African Americans by police. We're experiencing a major economic downturn, and there's legitimate concerns about our electrical system and humans arising daily. And oh, by the way, with each passing day, our inattention to sort of looming potentially irreversible climactic changes poses ever greater risk. So I want to begin by noting that our university community rarely speaks with a single voice on complex issues, and we do not want it to. We advance knowledge, we increase understanding through our diversity, our disciplinary knowledge and expertise, our different worldviews, and our different experiences. As, El as I tell my students every single semester, if the problem is complex, the odds are the room is going to be smarter than you are. So you should walk in expecting to learn, and that's what I'm hoping we're going to do today. So at this particular moment, I think what's I think challenging and frustrating for all of us is that our differences appear to be pulling us apart as much as they're putting us together. We've got graduate students who are striking, faculty who are contemplating a voting confidence, and our students who typically can look to faculty and instructors for guidance feel confused. And yet at the same time, you know, especially after this open conversation with the faculty and students, you know, through the web, I've never been more proud to be part of this community. Students have come to campus to go to learn, staff have been amazing putting themselves at risk, balancing their lives. The faculty, incredible effort going hybrid and online, and our graduate students have really brought some, I think, important demands for social justice. So I'd like to say, first off, good on everyone and go blue. So with that welcome, I personally have three, three goals here. One is to just get some straight answers from some very basic questions that I think everyone in the community needs to know. Two, to voice some concerns on the part of the faculty that they've been willing to share with me over the last day or two. And three, most important, I think, to focus and help us get our amazing diverse talents to work together. Okay, but I didn't call this meeting. <laughs> I was just asked to get a moderated. So let me um, turn to Susan and Mark. And I'm gonna use first names here, not out of some deep familiarity, but to strip away what our sociology department might call titular charismatic authority. Or something. Okay, so um, Susan, let me start with you. What, what are you hoping to get out of this meeting? Uh, I think, frankly, Scott, I, that's, first of all, um, you know, it's a, I've been looking forward to this conversation. I think it's a really important thing for us to do for yeah. many, many reasons. And I think that the way that you laid out the goals are exactly right. Um, so what I would hope to get out of this conversation is to answer questions. Um, it's so important that people feel heard. And uh, we haven't been making people feel like they're heard and, and that's deeply problematic and we need to fix that. Um, and also I think it's incredibly important that we work together to bring our community together. I'm really concerned about what seems like becoming fractured. We can solve our problems together and we have a lot of common ground. At the same time, you know, we need to make sure that we fix the mistakes we've made and that we address them and that we work together. And so this to me, exactly as you said, is um, a step towards a range of things that we'll be doing to listen, to work together and to fix the things that aren't working right. Okay, one, and one quick follow-up because this is one thing I heard a lot in the thousands of comments I got is that, why start with a powerful white guy? You know, with me. No, why, I'm so why start with a powerful white guy like me? I mean, why not start with uh, Someone who maybe uh, let, hasn't been skateboarding downhill. Let, let me weigh in, and yeah. um, and then and Mark may have some some yeah. additional comments. So you know, as we're thinking about where to start, and again, it's really important. This is not what we see as the conversation. It's intended right, okay. to be one of many. Um, I, you're not known as someone who pulls your punches, and we, <laughs> I think that's important. Okay, <laughs> I think that right. matters. Um, it, you know, uh, you're. The complex systems is a complex challenge, set of challenges we're grappling with. And, you know, how, how many departments are you associated with? You know, at the same time, you're not a humanist, for example. Right. Um, and so clearly there are perspectives that you're not necessarily or not the best person to bring to this conversation. And that's one of the many reasons why we need to make sure that this is one of the series. 
Yeah. Having spent a lot of time with humanists, I'm pretty clear that I'm not a humanist. I've learned a bunch of so Mark, anything quickly to add? I mean, we, we yeah, quickly add. And first of all, thanks, Scott, for doing this on short notice. And you could say the real reason you're going to call me Mark is it's very difficult to say Schlissel. That's right. So that works for me. <laughs> but you know, for me, there's I really feel um, a stronger and stronger an erosion of trust uh, across the campus, trust in leadership, trust in me personally and the leadership team. Uh, and uh, I'm looking or groping for ways to rebuild the trust so that we can tap into our unanimity of purpose and really take the institution forward through this generational challenge. And you know, for me, it's a, an issue of trying to find ways to be more engaged with the faculty, more communicative, involve more faculty, get a broader array of input and have them know me and my thinking better. Uh, and then the second aspect is transparency. You know, that lack of trust plays out by people saying, you're not telling us everything, you're hiding something. Uh, and you know, the way to confront that is with you know, being there. So as Susan said, you know, this is hopefully the first of many different modes of reaching out to the faculty. And you're just the first person we picked on. All right, let's get, so let's, let's get at one, one, quickly, one quick thing. Um, as you know, I moved from LSA to, to management last year. One of the things we do at the business school, which I really like, is we begin these things with a moment of gratitude. We get very quickly, Susan, 30 seconds, speak to the amazing mindset that our students, both undergraduate and graduate, have brought to the educational experience this fall. They've been incredible. So just give it up. They, they have been incredible and you know and uh 30 minutes is hard at uh, 30 seconds 30 minutes would be yeah, hard right yeah. that, that's exactly the point i mean in this incredibly stressful time the engagement the activism the commitment to education and also to um all of the different things that the diversity of experiences on our campus and to working with our faculty and our staff of course as well um, to really accomplish our mission. So I, you know, I was so inspired, for example, by the, um, the uh, musical theater seniors mm -hmm. and their absolutely incredible joy in being back here on campus despite the challenges. And that's just one of many examples, but the, our students really have been incredible and they Mark, continue to be. Mark, really quickly on the staff as well. Because I mean, I worry that this is the, the all faculty graduate quickly. Well, I think it's enormously difficult for the staff. You know, almost all of our staff are working remotely that can. We're going to continue that through the semester. And they're missing the personal touch. Uh, yet, because they're working at home and we're doing a lot through these uh, video conferences, the separation between home and work has almost disappeared. And most folks, and many folks, are dealing with the kids at home and family at home. Uh, so the multitasking is amazing. The intensity of effort of the staff, not just at the executive team level, but all the way down the line into the departments and into the student life, uh, people are working flat out. And I'm worried actually how much longer our staff can continue to function at this level of intensity without the reinforcement that comes from being more social. Okay, thank you. And again, I'm gonna echo those thoughts. They've been amazing. So now we're gonna get, to be honest, to the tough part. So I'm gonna just to give a sense of the arc of the conversation, there's gonna be two topics that really just completely rose up from this. The first is gonna be this notion of sort of our particular public health informed reopening strategy, how that's played out, a lot of concerns about transparency there. And second, what has our response been to what has been a societal uprising, a kind of epic proportion in, rela in relation to structural racism, right? That we've seen and really the lack of response. I mean, that's what I'm hearing from students and from faculty. So we're gonna bracket in those two topics and kind of overarching themes on that are gonna be related to transparency. So let's start with the public health informed um, reopening. And I'm gonna put this under sort of three T's. But the first one is just sort of what transparency in the process. The second is gonna to relate to testing. What is our testing strategy? So first process, then testing. And then the third is the, some of the teaching issues. And so what, what exactly, what was the policy under this? So let's start with this question of the process. What were the set of options very quickly that were considered for, for how we were going to do this reopening? What was the choice set? Uh, Susan, you want to go first, or yes. what would you like to do? Oh, um, let me let me go first, and then uh, we then we can share this one. Um, you know, I, I think it's important to start by. Um, Sharon, by making it clear that people often think about this as a choice between very, very different options. And that's right. really not the way that we're thinking of 
that, that okay. that's not the reality. So it was not a choice between go remote and everyone stays home and um, you know things are significantly safer and there are fewer public health issues versus right. bring students to campus and then you have all of these challenges to deal with because even if we taught remotely and we didn't have students in our dorms, most of our students would be in Ann Arbor in the community anyway. Um, and so it really was um, trying to understand what were the differences and what were the priorities and how could we mitigate the risks that would be involved with different uh, scenarios? So I could keep going, but I think that's really the yeah, important yeah. framing. Yeah, and you know, for me, the mission of the university is critically important to society. So you know, we do research, and much of our research is on COVID nineteen right now and other related things. Uh, we do teaching, we do clinical care, we do other forms of societal service, and we were looking at a pandemic that's going to be around for an uncertain length of time. So the way we approached it is what can we do to be able to deliver on the greatest fraction of the value of our mission as possible, while at the same time mitigating as much of the risk of living in the COVID-19 era uh, as possible. So you know, we set up a, a expanded leadership group that involved all the folks that would touch the different parts of the university's mission of teaching, research, and clinical care. We stood up a number of experts committees to uh, help us understand better the public health landscape. Uh, and uh, of course, now the uh, no noted or notorious ethics and privacy committee to think through the things we were asking folks to do during a pandemic, very unusual. And we realized we had to be way more centralized than we are usually because um, uh, we had to make decisions relatively quickly. Information was changing all the time. What we knew in March or April or May when we started thinking about the fall is really different than what we know now. So we needed something that was fluid and flexible. And I think in hindsight, one of the errors I made is I took a very experts focused approach that became narrow. And what I lost sight of was the breadth of how the campus is experienced and the breadth of wisdom of all the different components of the campus. So if I had to go back to March or April again, I would have developed other mechanisms to get more and broader types uh, of advice and input. So let me, let me ask a couple, bunch of specific questions that came from the community. So, like, so why aren't Illinois testing everybody, right? We are not. Notre Dame tested everybody before they showed up. We did not. Yeah. How, how were those choices made? So, you know, testing is one component of uh, a public health strategy. Testing doesn't prevent disease. It tells you if you're sick or it tells you if you have the virus and it only tells you at a moment in time, but it's an essential component. Uh, upstream, you have to wear masks and social distancing and keep the densities low. Downstream, you need to be able to do case investigation and, and contact tracing and quarantine. So testing is one component. Uh, as was the case all across the nation, testing was a limited resource here at the university. And until quite recently, it's continued to be a limited resource. It's not just the ability to buy a test from a company, but if you can't get the result of that test back in a day or two, it's not very valuable to know that a week ago, somebody had or didn't have COVID-19. So we've really struggled uh, getting access to adequate capacity of high turnaround testing. What we did is we applied the capacity we had to test sick people, to use it in our hospital, Anyone with a symptom, you know, UHS is testing 50 to 100 people a day. And I won't go on and on, but it's a complicated thing, but we tested all the students before they arrived in the dorms. We're testing anyone in the Greek system before they arrive. And now we're ramping up our surveillance uh, uh, test system now at 3000 tests a week, up to 6,000 and then beyond in the coming weeks by using an outside startup company in the city that has the saliva test up and running. And we'll be able to greatly expand the capacity. But testing is one part of an integrated system Illinois, this famous example, I think they did best in class. I think they got a good test running. They're testing everybody twice a week. Their entire uh, uh, residential life is on lockdown. Because right. the other things that you have to do, uh, masks and distancing, they didn't do well enough. And the parties, they didn't control well enough. So they're doing best in class testing and their university is closed down. Well, Susan, when you spent you know, a career evaluating public policy, right? And one of the things you know, that, you know as well as anyone is there's, there's words on paper and then there's the behaviors that people actually do. And some of this is getting incentive. A lot of the questions that came forward, and I, and I had great sympathy for this, 
the incentives kind of got mucked up here. There were disincentives to tax. I mean, to, to go get the tax. So for example, resident advisors, you know, one question she said, if a student resident advisor, a student working in the residence hall, if they test positive, do they lose their pay? No, no, of course not. Absolutely not. That was guaranteed to them the first week they right. raised the question, Scott. It's in okay. writing. So, but do you feel, Susan, and then, you know, there's also been talk, I mean, I get some of this has been repaired, right? But they, they were suddenly sent to North Campus in a room with no sheets and a cold bag of chips. I mean, do you, I mean, Susan, when you look back at this, if you're in a 360 this, even though we're three weeks in, as a public policy expert, how, how have we done? I think in some places we have not done nearly as well as we needed to. I mean, I think that that's clear and you've given some examples. Um, you know, we started by talking about some of the things that were going well, but I actually think it's totally appropriate to focus on some of the problems. And, and so why don't we do that? It's not excusable that um, any of our students uh, who are in quarantine or isolation aren't well supported with all of the supplies that they need. It's a stressful, difficult situation and context, and that just shouldn't have happened. I mean, that's clear. Um, uh, so, you know, I apologize for that. I and my colleague, Vice, um, Vice President of Student Life, Martino Harmon, has apologized as his team, team has, and they've actively been working to make sure that every single room is fitted with whatever it needs, and that all of the students get the support that uh, they should have if they're in those spaces. So that's just, that's a, a really important example. Right. We're, you know, we're learning together on the fly, and uh, we certainly we didn't get it all right uh, as we went along the way. Um, and we, you know, we need to fix that. But as, as you know, I mean, one of the things you know, we talk about, no, no offense, Mark, or something I'm taking, is that, you know, the president provides vision, you know, and sort of but the provost, you're running the show, right? And so one of, one of the, not to put blame on you, but the thing is, you know, this is the operational side of the university. You give yourself a chief operational officer. This is a really complex thing. We've never done it before. So we're going to expect, um, I think, some mistakes. But move in, in particular, I think, is a is a case where we maybe didn't do as well as we could, have, right? Um, are there lessons from that? I mean, we can't go back and redo move in. So the lessons from that 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 we can take and move that we're taking moving forward. In fact, you know, just one, one comment I heard is it's easier to get in um, to the dorms than it is to get into the Apple Store. For instance, at present, right? I mean, just in terms of our security protocols. So there's, I mean, everything we're doing along the way, we're learning in terms of, um, and there, uh, there have been specific examples in which um, students who were moving in, uh, some, uh, some of the protocols may not have been followed, and then certainly then following up. But, you know, so move in is not is not one of the repeated things. Right. But certainly we draw lessons from anything that didn't go as smoothly as it should have during the move-in. And um, we'll be revisiting that and improving things uh, going forward. You know, you know there, are, there are other things that are ongoing that we're focused on in real time as well. As we hear the important feedback that something's not working well, and I suspect we're going to talk about it later, but I might mention the ambassador program. We're, right addressing that in real time and, and that's a process so you know as you said at the beginning the people all around the room are you know have uh, important input and we need to respond to that and to listen and to engage so another big thing that comes up is the sort of uh, surveillance test asymptomatic people so you know one one concern i've heard from community is that if you were in contact with someone who had covid when you go to get a test the questions you're asked are about your symptoms there's not just simply a, a check of, I was in contact with, I mean, just sort of general surveillance testing. And we're, Michigan has a tremendous reputation of leaving a leader in doing sort of natural experiments, A-B testing. And yet we've kind of, and you two are huge proponents of this. I mean, you know, what we did with the Hale program and what we, and Susan, what we sort of moved the whole board school in this direction on sort of natural experiments. It's an amazing hire. And yet here, we kind of went with a kind of like, it appears to the community Sort of a hierarchically imposed here is our strategy as opposed to maybe more of a learning strategy is there um well, there i'd say about that or is that not the true? strategy was developed by our public health advisors right the same people that are working with the governor and the same mm -hmm. folks that run influenza surveillance for the state of michigan are doing our program mm -hmm. it's absolutely evolved with time as our capacity has grown but there's a misunderstanding of what surveillance is supposed to do surveillance is a way to detect 
how well our other mechanisms are working. Right. How well is masking working? How well is social distancing working? What's the disease burden? And the purpose of doing that is so we could identify areas of weakness that we could then mitigate the weakness. So if we survey a dorm and we see more than the expected number of cases, that dorm gets interventions. Uh, so that's the purpose of surveillance. It's not if you give everybody a test once a week, everyone will be fine. Uh, that, that's not the purpose of surveillance. Uh, so, and you know, this number 3000 tests that we're, we're geared up to do now and will be increased to 6000 tests in a few weeks. And if we use pooling, it can go up even further. You know, that's being driven by what we learn, what's learned elsewhere. Our percentage of positivity is exceptionally low on this campus. If you literally compare how we're doing compared to other campuses, even campuses that are fully remote, like up in Lansing, yeah. uh, you know, I don't want to say anything and jinx us, but you know, the students must be behaving themselves and, and uh, on average doing very well. The faculty is obviously protecting themselves as we're not having cases there. So these techniques work and surveillance is there to look for weak spots. So, I mean, again, our students have just been spectacular in this. So let me, um, Susan, when you look across, I mean, some of the stuff we've done has also been innovative and maybe people don't know about like the, the testing of the, um, the water, right? Sewage testing, right? Is that, are, things, are there things that are like that that are working, not working? Um, so there, and again, and let me ask you premise this, um, sometimes a little hard to hear a question. So the first sure. one you said, can I? Uh, so we're doing things like uh, just what's what's been successful and what hasn't yes. in your mind? Yeah. Um, so so uh, you'd mentioned the the wastewater projects. Yeah, so the but, ingenuity of our, our our faculty, I think, is really important. We do have faculty um, who have. Uh, created some really important initiatives and they're, they're, they're early, they're getting started. And there certainly is one that is assessing risks within our facilities using wastewater, using um, tests of air uh, and surfaces. And we will learn over time as those results actually um, are, are, you know, come forward. That, and there's also uh, a variety of different types of work that, um, you know, I would point to the incredible effort that our faculty and our staff did over uh, the summer, not only to design and redesign their courses, so as to figure out how to use technology to have be remote in more kind of effective, enhanced ways compared to where we were in the winter. And that, that's still a work in progress, of course. But teaching hybrid is really hard. And I just commend our faculty, our instructors for the really impressive work that they've done. They've worked together, they've used our academic innovation, CRLT, they've reached out in a variety of ways to learn from each other. And instead of spending the summer focusing on their research and kind of gearing up, they're working really hard. Okay. Um, and that, that's an ongoing, that's a work in progress. And I think it's important. Okay, so have, let, me, let, me, let me turn then to the teaching thing. So one of it, and this may be the big issue in this whole space is that, so a survey was sent out, at least let me tell my experience, early in the summer saying, what are you gonna do, right? Are you gonna go hybrid, right? To go in person to the extent you want? Do you have a medical reason or some other reason why you cannot be there in person or someone in your family? Or three, would you, what I call the Bartleby answer, would you just prefer not to, right? Be in the classroom. Now, this is where, again, I worry a little bit as someone who, you know, is a senior tenure professor, I have a tremendous sense of job security. I didn't feel any obligation, right, to teach in person. I did not feel pressure to show up. And this, I'm gonna direct this to Susan because you know, you're you know, trained in public policy, social scientists, survey research kind of a place, right? Was that survey framed in the right way why, why was the reaction, I mean, like, clearly there was a reaction people felt obligated, right? As opposed to being at their discretion. Why was that? I mean, who's that on? And what can you say about that? So, so let me say a couple of things about it. First, absolutely the intent, and this is something that I and Dean cycled back to um, through as the summer unfolded, the intent was that um, to accommodate any instructor, and that's uh, faculty as well as GSIs, who did not want to teach in person. Um, right. And, you know, I, I worry a lot about issues of hierarchy, issues of um, whether uh, people feel free to, to make statements, which is exactly why we kept coming back to that intent. 
at the same time, and when um, we have learned about uh, instances where there are problems, we have jumped in to address them. I mean, that has been one of the priorities. Can I say that we have figured out everyone and heard all of them? No, unfortunately I can't. And I, I recognize that there are challenges there. Um, I, I also want to. I, I also think it's important that um, in our distributed campus, uh, where lots of important decisions are always made at the unit level, mm -hmm. um, that the decisions were actually, um, in, in many, if not most, and should have been all cases, made collaboratively with what really needs to be taught in person and why as we really think about our you know, commitment to the best education possible under the circumstances and how do we accommodate that? And then as we got closer to the beginning of the semester and when anxiety started to increase, I think it's not surprising that more things went remote. And to me, that was evidence that we were accommodating as additional requests came forward. Um, you know, but again, this is always a work in progress. It, it is that interaction though uh, and and I think that having processes to address problems matters, but it also really made sense to have um, this, as all of our curriculum is done, um, be something that was uh, figured out in the context of each of the programs, which are so different. We, we, we only have 88, uh, we have 88% 88 of our uh, credits that are, that are actually remote. Uh, and so that's how things evolved over the summer. So two, I mean, two things that, I mean, are just front of mind for me. I mean, was it the case that there were some, and especially GSIs here, maybe the more important communities, again, because of the lack of sort of security, were there GSIs and professors who were either explicitly required to teach in person or felt so obligated to teach in person that they that anything other than that would have, they would have felt been detrimental to their career? And if, if so, how many? And what has been done to sort of accommodate that or See, let me start on that one and then turn it over to Susan. Yeah. So, um, we can't, I can't answer the question, probably nor can Susan in terms of numbers. Yeah. Uh, and we certainly don't know who didn't feel comfortable speaking yeah, up. Yeah. So that's a yeah. really valid point, Scott. Yeah. So we didn't know that. But when we've repetitively asked and talked to the deans multiple times down to the department chairs, um, we didn't want to put people in that circumstance. And a very low fraction of our curriculum is actually being taught in person. So it's unknowable. Okay. If, we did the, if we did it the other way around, Scott, if we said, uh, let's not teach in person at all, too many people are concerned, and then some people don't feel free to tell us that they're concerned, so let's just not do it. Then there are many, many, many of our students that are disadvantaged. You know, there are students that need organic chemistry lab to go to medical school, and there are students that are getting violin instruction. There's a whole nursing school of students that need to be in person. Uh, so those kids, would, those young people would be disadvantaged. And then when you talk about our dorms, uh, you know, if we t don't uh, have in-person class uh, and don't fill the dorms, there are going to be students that are disadvantaged in the dorms because they don't have safe places uh, with good internet and a, a safe environment to study at home. We have kids coming out of the foster care system living in our dorms. So there's a, a real equity issue of who can live in town and have a good time while we're fully remote if we're not providing housing for kids that also need an education but don't have other great options. So it's just a complicated problem. We gave as much flexibility as we could. We're open to new ideas. Just if okay. we if do this the next semester, we want to do it better. Absolutely point taken. I think the thing is there's there is, you know, this was this was a GEO um, position, but also, I mean, as you know, there's now more than 600 faculty and they and it, just, it breaks, you know, pretty much 150 senior faculty, 150 associate, 150 assistant, 150 lecturers. Um, Society Fellows people, you know, who sort of bravely stood up and said, look, we're standing behind the GE, you know, GEO for, I mean, what people want to, their phrasing is, I'm going to use their exact phrasing, a universal unqualified right to work remotely that they feel is in the best interest of the broader university community. And I think there's a lot of, I mean, again, we, as a community, people talk about this is that no one's getting a representative sample, but there's, you know, so one thing I think that would help here is if, 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 the university would come forward or you would come forward and say, look, this notion of a universal unqualified right to work remotely is something we adhere to, we believe in. Is that true? Or is so, it somewhat qualified reason <laughs> right to work remotely? So I think the process matters here, Scott. Okay, and sure. that, right, and, and that is that it, and I understand the, um, 
so so let me just be really clear. Yeah. If there are uh, if there are instructors who you who strongly prefer and that not to teach remotely, we will accommodate them. That has been what we're doing to 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 accomplish that by just saying up front, just everybody opt out. I think doesn't focus the attention on us working together towards our educational mission. And okay. so okay. it's so that quickly. difference okay. that to me, I think is, is important. Okay, so very quickly on that. So the, if someone doesn't feel comfortable, if there's a graduate student instructor, you know, teaching a faculty, what, what do they do? They email you personally, who do they, what are they, what's their rep? So we've had people coming forward um, and that is, uh, you know, typically you'd come forward first to your department chair or okay. your dean. And if then there's a problem, then um, we have had uh, concerns that have been brought to me, the provost, and I've followed okay. up on, on every single one. I, I do want to say the before provost, I said, the provost, you're, you're, So when they come to that department, your department chair should say what? I'm, I'm sorry. So what should the department chair say? I want you to give a look, you know, even though we're- The department chair should uh, should say, we will we will find ways to accommodate. Um, the, Scott, let, let me mention one thing as well about this, because it's folded into our uh, working with the GEOs to get folks actually back into the classroom, yeah. is that was one of the requests of GEO is the right at any point in time to decide uh, without scrutiny that they've changed their mind and they don't want to teach the way they had said they would teach. And, you know, we had a solution worked out and a memorandum of understanding where there was a pathway for anybody who felt uncomfortable to stop teaching in person. And then we had a, 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 an investigation pathway where we could look at what the risks were in that classroom, whether there were particular problems, and then work it out with the GSI. So we understand how people become concerned once they're in the middle of their class based on behavior in the class or issues like that. We clarified rules around masks. If, you, if a student doesn't wear a mask and you tell them to put it on and they say no, you can walk out and cancel the class. So, you know, we were working on these issues, but you're right, they are really important ones. People have to be confident and comfortable to do their work. Okay, let me, I'm gonna- I, I just wanna correct okay, one thing I said. Yeah. I said that I should have said 78% of our credits are okay, remote, that's what I not thought. 80. I thought it was, <laughs> yeah. I would, I would, but I figured out oh, we had a 10% drop this morning. Who knows? Okay, so <laughs> no. a, possible. And then this is unfortunate. We've got slightly more time. The second big issue here is structural racism. And I'm going to soapbox this a little bit because, uh, you know, like everyone else in America, I sit around this and I'm going to watch what has really been, a lot, according to Wikipedia, so it's got to be great, the largest sustained protest in our country's history, right? Um, the University of Michigan has structures in play between our National Center for Institutional Diversity, between Rob Seller's office. DAS, our Presidential Collegiate Postdoctoral Fellows, to be the leader on this, right? And I'm sitting back, the graduate students are sitting back, faculty sitting back and we're saying, well, Hollywood said you can't even be up for best picture unless you do these things. The NBA changing their names on their uniform and get things all over the court. The New York Fed economists like me are running panels on economic inequality and COVID and how do we communities of color to recover, right? You know, Washington University is doing a moonshot of 12 faculty to study structural racism. Stanford, Stanford, hardly the leader in this, right? They have like five, you know, African-American junior faculty or something. 10 new hires on structural racism. We have, you know, Rob Sellers, a person of incredible capacity and passion in this space. And one of the, you know, one of the things I heard from almost as a single voice from faculty and graduate students is, we witnessed this all summer. This has been Michigan's thing. This is where we have been a leader in the educational, of educational institutions worldwide. And we came back to nothing. I mean, with the exception of our theme semester that was supposed to be on the election, which did a pivot, kind of an incredible pivot, to focus on some of these issues. But no new hires, no new department, no new, and I realize there's budget issues. And one of the things we're hearing a lot about is, is money making decisions for our principals. But so good on the grad students. I mean, eventually, you know, I know Susan said this in the past that they're our future. I mean, we are keepers of the flame in some sense, right? And we're going to hand the academy off to the people we're training and good on them, right? For holding our feet to the fire. What are we doing here, right? So let's start academically. What's in the works right now, academically, 
institutions, from an educational perspective, to help our society solve this? What do we do? So I think that we really deserve that criticism. We, th these are hugely important issues. Um, as you said, they are you know, kind of heart and soul of the University of Michigan. We need to be a leader in this space. We will be a leader in this space. And we, we have been working on a variety of things. We were just slow. And, you know, and I, I will uh, be the first to say that that's a problem. And uh, I actually appreciate the attention that GEO, that our students and others have put on these issues across campus. So what are um, some of the kinds of things that we will be rolling out and announcing? They will involve um, issues related to uh, a cluster hire, to bring more faculty on campus to work with our really uh, strong, incredible already encourage the uh, existing resources for proposals, but we need to do a lot more and we need to build on the strengths that we already have to be one of the leaders in best. So, so that's one of the initiatives and there will be more being rolled out. And simply, I think, I think I, we owe the community an apology for not having gotten that out more quickly. Um, being a really busy sum, uh, summer is not an excuse for that. Right. So I mean, let me, let me put this to Marcus. So a friend of mine wrote a book about how we, you know, I study complex systems. And in a complex system, you're never gonna get things right, right? So complexity in some sense implies a sense of humility. But do you, in this space, do you think if when the, our graduate students came back, and our undergraduates came back, if we would have had this academic initiative toward, because look, they're gonna be trained to go run the future academy. They need training in this, right? Do you think if this had been an impetus that we'd have the GEO? Yeah, I would say, Scott, and it's not an excuse because it is what it is. And you know, I share Susan's belief that we could have gotten to this more aggressively. Uh, if it, I would tell you, if it wasn't for COVID-19 and everything else was happening that you described, I think you'd be looking at a very different circumstance. Uh, the Susan and I began discussions back in the summer months uh, while all of us were transfixed by the, seemed like the drumbeat week after week of unarmed black men and women being killed with law enforcement uh, encounters. And we said, this is a moment, you know, we have ongoing work in this area. This is a moment. I sure hope and pray that we don't lose the moment. Let's get up and do something here. Uh, Rob Sellers put together a series of recommendations for what we should consider. Susan put together a list of recommendations. You know, we're working on it and brainstorming. And, and guess what happens? We're trying to manage whether or not to bring students in, for in-person instruction and how to make a safe semester in the setting of a historically significant global pandemic. Okay, so absolutely. No excuse, but it, yeah. in the moment, Scott, it got crowded out of the way, not to be forgotten, to be picked up at the same time we're worried about people's individual health and safety and how to stay ahead of an infectious illness. And here's absolutely here's the and here's the pushback I'm hearing. And right, here's the pushback I'm hearing from the faculty, and that is this: that, that is because there's been a move towards more centralization. We did not have the administrative capacity, which is that, and that this isn't. I'm not giving you an excuse to handle completely redoing how we do education and moving and everything else and testing to deal with the pandemic and launch this thing. But we had the collective community capacity to do it with our faculty, with our students, with our graduates. But because we were in this hierarchy, we couldn't do it. But if we'd have done it as a community, we could have done it. That's what- That's a really great point, Scott. Yeah. And I think that that's can go in the category of lessons learned in that you're right. And the unusual thing, and I think what has a lot of people upset uh, is um, uh, uh, there's been more centralization in the last few months than in the six or years or so that I've been here. Yep. Uh, so, um, it's because of the pandemic and things evolving very quickly. So this pyramid that you mentioned, uh, typically, you know, we'll devolve things to units and people will spend months to years working on them. But this notion of us saying, look, the central administration is busy figuring out a safe semester. Why don't you, Scott, be the point person, work with faculty colleagues who must have the, or might have the capacity to help us not lose the moment. And in hindsight, that was a great idea. And yeah, this is actually what we're welcoming. Uh, I love ideas like this because they're constructive and positive uh, moving. You know, Susan wanted to you know, talk also about what we're doing around policing and safety. We've been talking about this all yeah, I'm gonna get there just a second. Yeah. The students are there as well. Yeah. Let me, 
one one last thing on this though. One last quick factor. So let me let me just you know call out um, you know Erica Newman, who's a fabulous person in our medical system. You know works on you know community based health. And if Erica were here instead of me, and I would strongly recommend her as maybe someone who's in a future conversation, she'd say, look, you can't pull this apart. It's a system. It's not COVID and structural inequality, right? They are linked. Community health, structural racism, right? Economic inequality, quality, you know, differences in sort of people's capacity to live lives of, in which they flourish and excel are not things you can deal with one at a time. It's not like a house where you're going to paint this room and this room and this room and this room. It's a shaky foundation. And so the, the whole approach to, to bracket that ignore the complexity of the system. So I, mean, I, yeah. I, I couldn't agree with that more. So a couple of things. One is I'm passionate about these issues. They're really, really important and we need to do that. Yeah. But, but just to jump right in, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion issues are really infused in what we do. And so the way that we've been planning for having students back on campus was, I mean, certainly focused on those from issues of accessibility to this ambassador program, which certainly we didn't listen enough in terms of understanding the implications, but the goal of that was to minimize the chances that students off campus, if community members called because of a party, were gonna have the um, police come. And so the intent was to find a, a thoughtful educational way that was inclusive um, and uh, to be more supportive in particular of our black students, our students of color. Now, clearly we didn't listen enough in terms of what some of the implications were, but the intent was, was uh, the intent was there and we'll fix the problems with it. Okay, so it, the amazing thing to me, I mean, with the, the grad students have pushed the other side of it. We only got like three minutes, but the other side of this was a community. This is a chance, you know, we have a, we have a mayor, we have a new city council, including one of our own faculty members, Lisa Dish, all right, Lisa. Um, on city council, they're, they're posed to make Ann Arbor an exemplar, right? We as, as a, and we have probably better town and gown relationships than almost any university. So I don't think anyone that I've talked to, even among grad students, feels like the grad students should dictate our policy on policing. But I think they do feel as though graduate students and undergraduates in more vulnerable populations should be a seat at the table. So again, another kind of drop ball here is what's in motion both at the community at the university and university and community to make Ann Arbor and the University of Michigan a role model, an exemplar for a new type of community safety. What do we do? Absolutely. So I'm uh, announcing right now that we are launching a process that will involve that community engagement because it is absolutely imperative that um, all members of our community feel safe um, and that's the role of our public safety. So that initiative has to involve all members of our community, but it shouldn't be top down from Fleming. And so the first part will be outreach to make sure that we are moving forward with the process. And I'll be announcing this in, in the next days uh, to do that outreach so that we can figure out together and that we aren't trying to design it. Just as you said, we're using our undergraduates, our graduate students, especially our students of color, our faculty and faculty experts, our staff, our community members, and our uh, Department of Public Safety, um, and, uh, you know, and, and the Ann Arbor community as well. So um, listening to what the best ways are, we've received a number of ideas, and we don't think that we have all of the, the right ideas. And so we'll work together in order to launch that process with a task force that will commit, will be transparent, will be inclusive. It will um, address whatever issues are, are uh, surface. So we wanna know what's going well, what isn't, and what we need to address. And we'll just make sure that we do in fact, not only have the best police uh, public safety department here uh, on a campus, but also that we are an exemplar and leveraging our great faculty and research um, to address broader issues of policing across the society. So yeah. I couldn't agree more with, okay. the, with the goal. And I know, go get them, all I can say. I want, when I, time's running out, so I just want to sort of end with this. Is it, uh, the, the poet Richard Hugo has this book called 31 Letters and 13 Dreams. And one of them is in your bad dream. And one of them is in your perfect dream. And I want to argue that this has been framed as your bad dream. But if I look back and I say, 
I think it's your perfect team. You've got a set of students who've never been more dedicated to learning. You've got faculty who, you know, one of the world's great research faculty who spent the entire summer saying, how do we teach? You've got graduate students who've said, you know what? We want to redefine campus safety. We want to, we want to give voice to, you know, our concerns. You've got staff who are bringing it every single day. This is your, if you wrote down what you would like your community to be bringing, and the, the goal here is not to block that passion, right? Which is, I think, is the perception we're having. The goal is to harness that, to harness that these amazing collections of professions to make us a better place. And so, you know, for me to leave here and think, I didn't just waste 45 minutes, but which I didn't, this was helpful for me, but for me to leave here and feel like we're moving, I just want one thing for me, Chief. You're going to walk out of here. And I want, what's one thing you're going to do that maybe you wouldn't have done before here, right? It's going to make this place better. It's going to bring us together. So um, I'll start with you, Mark, so that Susan gets a moment to speak. <laughs> uh, so what I'm going to do is more of what we just did, Scott, and you know, not just with you, obviously, because you're just one perspective and you voiced it clearly. <laughs> but you know, there are many perspectives across the campus. A lot of them are screaming so loudly I can't hear them. Right. Okay. Uh, but I need to do more communicating with more different types of people to better understand the collective vision. And you know, I appreciate our grad students' voice, but I want to hear our faculty's voice, and I want to hear our community members' voice, and I want to hear our neighbors in Ann Arbor's voice, and I want to hear our staff's voice. Uh, so I need to. The thing I walk away from is the value of listening and hearing what's people's on people's mind, rather than presuming. And the fact that I'm working 20 hours a day doesn't mean that there isn't more to be done that we need to do together, and we could do in parallel. That was a really interesting lesson you mentioned that. Perhaps the faculty is willing to take some responsibility for things that the academic leadership doesn't have the bandwidth to do because we're trying to keep everybody safe and trying to keep our classrooms at high integrity. Susan. So I really heard what you said, Mark, about, uh, Scott, sorry, uh, about um, what our faculty are saying that we are not using them and their expertise. And so I would say if I had to pick one takeaway, it would be to, much more uh, actively, especially on the police, well, starting with the policing initiative, but on so many other things that we really all care deeply about um, to directly engage them in that work and empower them and support them so that we're all rowing in the same direction and accomplishing the things that we really care deeply about. Thank you. I just, I just want to end with this. Like 39 years ago, I, I came here pretty wide-eyed kid from Yankee Springs, Michigan, right? And this place has fundamentally changed me. And I care so deeply about this place. And it's on you a little bit here in these next couple of weeks to keep this thing together and to allow people, whether they're from Ishpeming or Battle Creek or Flint, to come here, have these experiences and change the world. And this is on us and it's on you to keep us together and make this work. I, I thank you for this opportunity for me to, to, to share and to challenge and to question and to bring things forward. And to all those in the university community, the thousands of emails I got and, the, and I, you know, I hope I voiced some of your concerns and go blue and let's uh, all you know, try and work together to make this the amazing university it can be. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Scott. And thanks to everybody for taking the time in the middle of their day to listen. We'll do more of this too, but thank you very, very much. We look forward to it. Thank you. Yep. Bye everyone. Thank you.